Estamos en Stockport, en el noroeste de Inglaterra, y aquí, en Edgley Park, en la casa del Stockport County, os vamos a contar la historia de cómo la mayor leyenda de este club es uruguayo. So, all I said to the lads is, look lads, ok, we are playing against Premier, but uh, they've got two legs, they've got two arms, two eyes, two one nose, etc, etc. I said all the things as well, and they would be laughing their heads off when they listened to me. And, uh, and at the end of the day, if we just believe in our own ability, if we believe in our systems, and if we can just go out there with no fear, anything can happen. Cuando en Edgley Park se menciona a Dani Vergara, todo el mundo coincide en que es probablemente el hombre más importante de la historia del Stockport County. Y lo que de verdad hace especial la historia de Vergara es que es uruguayo. Y es que de hecho en su etapa como jugador no solo jugó en el Racing Club de Montevideo, sino que además es un viejo conocido del fútbol español. Jugó entre otros en el Real Mallorca, en el Tenerife o en el Sevilla. Pero después de terminar su carrera como jugador se marchó a Inglaterra. La razón es muy sencilla, su mujer con la que se casó era inglesa. Al llegar aquí, en 1972, se convirtió en entrenador de categorías inferiores del Luton Town, gracias a que su mujer tenía contactos con Harry Haslam, por aquel entonces el entrenador del Luton Town. Eso sí, su situación no era fácil, y es que incluso para regularizarle y que le dieran el permiso de trabajo, tuvieron que decir desde el Luton Town que era un hombre que se encargaba de cargar y descargar camiones. Al final, su carrera le acabó llevando hasta tener su primer club, su primer puesto como primer entrenador de un club. Fue en 1988 con el Rochdale. Y lo hizo bien, porque solo un año después, el Stockport County le fichó y a partir de ahí empezó su leyenda en Edgley Park. We had a new chairman come in. Stockport were one of the perennial strugglers. I mean, if you look at our history, we're in the Guinness Book of Records for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> We're in there for having the smallest ever crowd back in, I can't remember, in the 1920s. We played uh, against Leicester Foss, as they were then known, Leicester City today, and uh, managed to re record a crowd of 13 mm -hmm. and a dog. And they said the dog went home at half time, <laughs> which I'm sure is them just uh, adding like, insult to injury. And we'd, have a, we'd really struggled. I mean, of the 92 teams during the 70s and 80s, if we finished 90th, that was a good season because that meant we weren't in the the bottom two for re-election. Uh, and then we got a new chairman, a guy called Brendan Elwood from Sheffield, and the fans were a bit shocked that this guy wanted to take us over. And we had at the time managing us, Asa Hartford, ex -Man, Man City, mm -hmm. uh, playing well for us, and the team were doing well. We were mid-table, but Brendan had his own vision on what he wanted to do. And uh, he sacked Asa and brought in Danny. And of course, nobody had heard of Danny. All they knew was it, it was a foreign guy from Rochdale. Uh, and he came in, and he, the first few games were a struggle. Uh, we didn't do well, did we, for the first four or five, and the fans were getting a bit... Uh, and then it just started to turn, and he started bringing in quality players like these guys. And before we knew it, the club was on the up. And what happened after that, during those next six years, will never be forgotten, and it's why he's revered. I'd, I'd spoken to him on the telephone, and as Jonesy said, he, he, this Uruguayan <laughs> comes on and he speaks with a bit of pigeon English. He, he, said, he, I he was Uruguayan. I knew it was Uruguayan, yeah. 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 I did my homework as soon as I found out. <laughs> so he rang us and I was at my mother-in-law's and I, he said, I want you to come down and sign. So I got a phone call from the club. I, I'd gone to Rochdale. Danny had left and I'd left Huddersfield and joined Rochdale. And Danny had rang us. He said, I need you to sign. Anyway, the chairman from Rochdale said, you're going to have to sign for Stockport. We've got no money to pay the lads over the summer. You're the only one we can sell. So they agreed a deal and it was 55 grand in the, plus a player in exchange. So I came over to meet Danny and I, I knocked on the big doors and I think it was Joanne who opened the door and she says, hi, I said, hey, I'm Peter Ward, I'm, I'm here to meet Danny Bigara. He says, all right, we'll go and find him. And then the kit man, Bish, came out, he says, I'll find the gaffer. And he's running everywhere. I can't find him, I can't find him. He says, just go and have a look at the pitch in the stadium. So I walked out the doors and I seen this little old man lying on top of the dugout with an air rifle. And I go, he was, oh, is that the groundsman? And he's, he's there, and he's shooting pigeons on the far side, I said. What you doing here? He turned around. I said, I'm here to meet Danny Bigar. He says, hold on a minute. He lines up and he shoots his pigeon. He went, oh, I missed it. 
He turned around and said, I'm Danny Bigara. The manager was lying on top of the dugout, shooting pigeons on the pop side. He said, I'm not having that. No, no pigeon. <laughs> no pigeon. <laughs> so anyway, that, that was my first introduction to him. So after that, we just got him like a house on fire. So I thought, what a way to break the ice. Cuando llegó Dani Vergara al Stockport County, lo hizo a un club en el que no conocían al uruguayo, por supuesto, y además era una institución que estaba estancada en la cuarta división del fútbol inglés. Llevaban unos 20 años en esa categoría. Dani Vergara no solo les llevó a la tercera división, sino que además, en un periodo muy corto de tiempo, logró que llegaran hasta cuatro veces a jugar en el gran templo del fútbol inglés, en Wembley. Dos de ellas fueron en la final del Football League Trophy y otras dos en el playoff de ascenso a la segunda división. Aunque con él no consiguieron ganar ninguno de esos cuatro partidos, fue suficiente para construir alrededor de él una leyenda que todavía hoy sigue vigente en Etchley Park. Everything was meticulous. We planned training sessions. Everything was technical. The warm-up. I remember my first training session. We'd been warm up for about an hour, and I thought, "Is that it? Can we go home now?" He says, "Oh, that's just the warm up." He says, "Training session starting now." <laughs> then we'd be out for 90 minutes. We'd do a 90 minute training session. Then I got introduced to warm downs. I'd never done a warm down in my life. And he said, "Where are you going?" I said, "I'm going to get showered." Gaffy said, "No, you're not. Get out there and warm down." So he, he made us. You know, warmed down. So ahead of his years, wasn't he? He was. He brought some great things to us, like you know, changed us. He never we'll said that to me. But <laughs> well, he had to warm up for us. He never got to the warm up <laughs> <Yeah>. bit. <laughs> he, missed, he missed one that as well. You know, for records at Edge of the Park. Oh, for you? Yeah. Well, that was the end of your career, wasn't it? That's why. You can share that one, Jonesy. Yeah, of course <laughs> can. Quickest sending off ever, Edge of the Park. Forty-five seconds. Who was it? <laughs> Paul Jones. <laughs> Danny comes to the dugout. We've only got ten men. You can do the accent better than me. <laughs> <laughs> he says, uh, "Where's Jonesy?" He says, "He's in the stand watching the game. <laughs> What's he doing up there? He's been sent off. <laughs> cost us promotion and cost you a two-year contract." <laughs> he said, well, and that was the end. But now, uh, apart from that, like you say. Danny was funny, another one. <clears throat> I was sent that off. He brought Jim Gannon. Now, Jim was supposedly a sent that off coming in to replace me. Anyhow, he made his debut against Wrexham at home. I think we got beat. And obviously, Jim was pointing the finger at everybody else, not himself. I got man up match. But next game, but this was Danny. He never kept the winning or the losing. He'd always change it. Oh, so I wasn't playing. I said, hold on. Uh, why am I not playing? I said, I got man at match. He said, well, I've got to see whether he can play centre half or not. And I upset him by questioning his decision. I said, you've paid a lot of money for him and you don't know whether he can play. Didn't go down well neither. <laughs> so, well, it was full of that with opinion, don't you? I remember once, I, I've always been very respectful being on the non football side of the white line. And we played away at Hartlepool and we lost 5 0, I think. So on the Monday, I was going down to do his programme notes, which, and they always used to set me up, the, the other coaching team, Dave Jones and John Sainty. I tried to get it out of the way in the day because I knew it'd be like a two hour session with him. And they used to always say, wouldn't it be better if he came back at the end of the day, Gaffer? Steve can come back at five. Yeah, Bello, come back at five. <laughs> so I knew I was going to be there till like seven or seven. Anyway, I come down, he went, right, Bello, what do you think about Saturday? I went, I I'm just, you know, marketing. I don't really know what, you know. No, Bello, I want to know. I want to know what you think. I said, yeah, but I don't, I don't give my opinion. You, know, you do that. You're the foot. Bello, what do you think? I said, all right, right. Clearly, we didn't defend very well and we didn't hold the ball in midfield. And we didn't really create anything. What do you know? Why are you giving me your opinion? But he, he, couldn't, get, he couldn't win. I'm like, sorry, Gaffer. <laughs> but he was just such a... He, wasn't. he couldn't help but love him. There is a good phrase that says that... Um, Philippe Tizier, a French fellow, said that uh, you walk with your legs, you run with your heart and your lungs, you resist with your stomach, and you get there with your brain. Well, the main thing for me was I'd come to Danny, and Danny was like the first foreign manager and it was different different the way where things were structured the way he wanted you to play you'd work on things all week man you'd change his mind at 10 to 3 and change yeah. the team wouldn't you yeah, well, you, you think you're you playing never knew. then at 10 to you 3 never you, knew. you never knew whether you were playing or not no. and you, we had systems mm. and, and 
you had to work on set plays. You really, we had to work on set plays. When you've got a, a, a two metre high centre forward called Kevin Francis, he said, just put it on his head, he'll score. So you had to <laughs> practice, practice, practice. So set plays were important. Don't give fouls away. Yeah. Don't get sent off in the first 45 seconds. <laughs> He was big on discipline on the pitch, you know, and he, and he said, yeah. and we worked on set players, defending set players, attacking set players, and this was all different to us because we, you, your best free kick take would just take normally, on it, but he, you know, people, he used to call them technicians, so you had technicians that crossed the ball from the left and the right, your full backs were very good physically, one that up and down, two centre halves were solid, but could pass out from the back, and everybody used to think we were a long ball game, but, one, but yeah. there were long passes, we didn't just kick it anyway, hoof it, did we? There were long passes no. played in areas where we would run into I them. think the good thing as well was like Rochdale and Stockport, all the lads took to him. Yeah, the like You know, um, they all took to him. They loved the way he went on. A lot of the times he was making them laugh as well, which you think is great. Even on the pitch, if he's going, Ooh, and all like that, going, yeah, all right. Just yeah. say, it, yeah, all right, and get on with the game and play it. But afterwards, you. Very rare you got a bollocking, did you? No, no, no. You, you, Very rare you got told off or out like well, that. Well, really, he's paved the way, hasn't he, if you yeah. think about it? You, you know, know. You, you look back, and at the time we didn't realise, but he's paved way for all the foreign, the, man the foreign managers foreign that have come managers. in. Coaches, yeah. come and they in. can't have been a proud moment. I remember no. myself getting really emotional being at Wembley. Yeah. I mean, the idea of Stockport County, this team, ever being at Wembley in itself was like the cathedral. He yeah. used to call it the, Wembley was the cathedral <laughs> of football. <laughs> and he said, a man from Uruguay. I'm at the Cathedral of Football. And he was walking around, he was just looking at... In awe, wasn't well, he? Exactly. But he looked the pride on his face. Yeah. And four, so, four times, right? So four Yeah, times. four times in the space of two... We lost all the, every game, but it doesn't matter. Oh, four right. times in two years, <laughs> three years. But the pride... And, and what he did, he, he really put Stockport County on the map. This club that were perennial strugglers. Don't get me wrong, in our history, we've had good times where we'd won championships in the 30s in the 60s. It always came in 30-year cycles, so unless you, were, <laughs> unless you live longer than 30 years, you didn't see a lot. Uh, and then it was the 90s, obviously, when, when we really hit it. But he put Stockport County on the map, and that's why, because of his character, because, because he was foreign, actually endeared him even more, because we'd not seen it before. Uh, and the fans just took to him because well, of who he was and the way he was with he the players the and people. He and he picked some great players, yeah. by the way. I mean, you look at... These are great examples, but when you look at your Kevin Francis, your Andy Priest, yeah. David Frayne, there's so many, and they were all quality footballers. And when people now do their best 11s, the amount of times the Danny signings are in there, mm. pretty much always mm. they're in there. He made the, the fans proud of Stockport County, yeah. and he made the players proud to play for Stockport County. Yeah. He did that, didn't he? Yeah. And I know he's serious and all, that, and all like that, but you could have a little laugh and a joke with him. Uh, and he, he was just, he, I don't know what to, how, how to explain it. It was what he said, he said to me, I, I, when I came, I, I struggled know. for the first few months of getting used to the training and everything in there. Then he said, just keep at it. He said, to be part of this club, you have to buy into it. You have to become yeah. a fan. You have to become one of them. He says, the unique, these fans are unique. He used to, he used to know them all, the hooligans. He taught the hooligans, yeah. no fighting in London. No fighting in London, he just say to them, and they used to say, all right, Danny, no fighting. So he went, oh, no. got a plan next week. <laughs> <laughs> he used to know them all, all the hooligans. He'd say to them, and he'd tell them off, and he'd say, no fighting, he says, our name means more. Yeah, it was and like the Messiah, wasn't he? He was, yeah. Well, plus he God. lived here as well, because he lived there at, yeah, you know. right across the road from the ground. Everyone knew where he was. He was yeah. part of the community yeah. as well as being so part of the club. And he time. never switched off. No. We had, I was telling Jan, his wife, this, uh, and she really loved the story. I was, it was Christmas Day, and we were playing on the Boxing Day at home, so Danny was staying in Stockport, ready for the game. And we'd been talking about Danny, because he'd always phone you at like ridiculous times, because whilst we've got other things to do, Danny was just Stockport County. That was his life, so he was at the ground all the time. So I'm there at my sister's, and we're having, just about to sit down for Christmas lunch, and the phone rang, and we all joked, that that'll be Danny. And my brother-in-law answered the phone, he went, Steve, it's Danny. <laughs> it really is Danny. Now, I've always had a nervous cough, and obviously, he's, he's heard this during the many years I've been with him. So I get to the phone. He went, hello. I said, hi, Danny. All right. Merry Christmas. I said, Merry Christmas, Danny. Have you got a pen and paper? I'm thinking, surely he's not phoned me up to borrow a pen and paper. <laughs> I said, yeah, right, good. Write this down. So, right. So, Sainsbury's expectorant lintus for chesticoff and catarrh. 
I said, right, Danny. He said, yeah, get some of that from the shop tomorrow. Sort that bloody cough out. <laughs> so anyway, I, t- I told everyone, we're all laughing. Typical Danny, still thinking about you. Anyway, so the, of course, I didn't get the same thing to the shop. The shut anyway, it was Christmas Day. Uh, but of course, the next week, I go to his office to do his programme notes for the next match, and he's sitting there. And all the way through, he's going, winking at me. Thinking, why is he winking at me? <laughs> and I don't know why I didn't cough. For some reason, I hadn't coughed. My nervous cough wasn't there. <laughs> And at the end of it, he went, you see, Bello, I'm not just your bloody manager, I'm your bloody doctor. Now bugger off. And that was me done. <laughs> but that was just Danny. He just never stopped thinking about the players, the people at the club, the club itself. Mm. He, he has to control everything. He lived across the road. He was like really meticulous, right? Meticulous. Absolutely. Planning, unbelievable. But he had to do everything himself because he didn't trust anybody yeah. else. You know? He, and, and he'd walk like, into clubs though, wouldn't he? And he'd, he'd go to an away game and he'd, walk, he'd find a sill or the top of the door and he'd do that. Look at that shit. <laughs> like, if it's shit in here, it's shit out there. And that was his way of saying. So sometimes I came back to the ground once I'd forgotten something. Half 11 on a Friday night and we had a game on the Saturday. We watched him and thought, who's in here? The lights are all on. And it was Danny. And he was in the kitchen polishing the geezer, the big hot water boiler, polishing it to make sure it was cl- clean for the next day. And that's him. He used to Everything walk, had to be right. Walk around the ground and if you had a squeaky door... <laughs> He used to go over to Edgeley to the shop and buy some oil and come back and oil the hinges. That's better. And he was happy. <laughs> if he went home, the door was squeaky, he wouldn't sleep. And later on, <clears throat> Toddy, he used to get Toddy doing the uh, corners, didn't he? Yeah. And if he, if he didn't get them spot on there, he had to do it again. Oh, Toddy used didn't. to be there for two, three hours every day just to get one ball perfect. Then he could go. Yeah. But that's what he brought into us, didn't he? He that's brought a different it, training. It, it, yeah. Te- it became technical. Yeah. But we were used to hard running, game of five yeah. aside, home, he home, wanted few beers. Different things. But he was he changed it. Yeah. He took diets. We st- he stopped us bringing cans of pop and sweets on the on the uh, coach and uh, bottles of water, fruit he used to put them on, he used to buy them sometimes and bring them, put fruit on for you. And try and encourage you. Never told you to stop him, but he tried to encourage you to eat fruit. And he used to sit at the front, didn't he? Well, he kept bagging. The, he kept the beer as well, though. Oh, well, he kept the beer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as you grow up, someone who would very much love you to become a footballer presents you with a ball. You kick it. You love that special feeling, and there it all starts. With your brothers or other boys, enjoyable days of practice and competition take place. You admire your favourite player, move, act and try to imitate everything he does. Miguez, Pele, Di Stefano and Santa Maria were some of my stars. Started attracting a better player, didn't we? Yeah. At the time, we couldn't attract the better players. He had to work really hard to get a player in, but as we got more and more successful and the, the, the team got to know him, people started to fear the team because it was a good, strong team and people wanted to come then, you know? so. The, he encouraged people to come and people wanted to join us because he knew that was, something was happening, didn't yeah. he? I think it was, they wanted to come because it, of Danny. Of Danny, yeah. yeah. Because I've heard of about Danny. him, yeah. And the style of football, yeah, I mean, we were attacking. Yeah, I mean, the football attack, was great attack, to watch. Attack. And they could, you just knew that every player, I used to say to lads, when he's whistling at you, what does he mean? They went, oh, we don't know. So what, what, what he said, all we do, we know exactly what we have to do because it's drummed into us. We carry on doing everything he tells us. And that's why we won. Every player knew what they had to do. Mm-hmm. It was attacking, it was great, wasn't it? And Danny had whistled, and of course, a lot of the fans think, oh, he's now, he's manoeuvring that, yeah. manoeuvring that. They were playing for him because they knew exactly what he demanded from them. And again, difficult to, you don't always get that, very difficult to replicate yeah, yeah. that. It's like you watch players now and managers doing that and all like that, and they're looking, what, what's going on? With the players that played for Danny, they knew what to do when he went on the pitch. So when Danny's shouting and bawling and all like that, they just go, yeah, all right and get on, carry on with their own game. Mm. Now, you watch it now, people are always looking to be told by the manager what to do. The lads didn't. We'd done our work during the week, hadn't we? They in did the their session. own thing as well. They were allowed to do their yeah, own yeah. thing. express yourself. Yeah, express yeah. yourself. And that's what, it, what it's football's all about. And I think every player got better under Danny. As he a did. fan, yeah. everybody he brought to the club, you'd think, yeah. why has he signed in? But then they'd get better, because yeah. technically, and he, used to, he was on the pitch doing it, wasn't well, he, with you? He, technically, he, he was... He could do it all. He could do it outside the foot, inside the foot, he bending made, free kicks. Yeah. Oh, it was he, brilliant. He made you mentally better as well. He did, yeah. To prepared, do yeah. your own thing and be strong enough to play the way you want to play. Yeah, he brought a psychologist in. Yeah. First person that brought a psychologist in yeah. our club.
He used to have, he had his same lunch every day. And he, yeah, again, we didn't have big, yeah, the ground had very few facilities. So in the area where his office was, there was a little kitchen and all it had was a grill. That was it. So he used to bring his own pieces of cheese that were cut perfectly to fit on a slice of bread. <laughs> and he'd put the toast in, put the thing up, and then grill it at the same time. So he'd toast one side, then turn it over and he had his cheese on toast. And it, but it had to be clean. If he ever went into that kitchen, it wasn't clean somebody was in trouble. Oh, yeah. And there was one Saturday, it was before the game. I, at the time, one of my jobs, I was in the club shop, serving the club shop. So there's people in the shop and Danny came running in. What is this? And he had the grill pan. Uh, the grill pan. It's got beans in it. I went, who's had beans? And those people in the shop going, I was just here to watch the game. Anyway, he stormed off. And somebody said, I think it's Roger Wilde who was the physio. And Roger had what Roger had done. He'd done the same thing. He'd put his toast and then turn it over and put beans on the top to warm them up in the, but some of them had fallen off and he'd not cleaned it. So that after that, every week, when you have every day, sorry, every match day, we had a, a list, a checklist of things that had to be right. And one of them was check grill pan for beans. <laughs> yeah. Part of the safety of the day, you know, you know <laughs> the floodlights, yeah, they're working. You know, make sure we've got enough footballs. Yeah, that's right. Oh, grill pan, beans, yeah. But that was just him. Everything had to be right. And if it wasn't, he wasn't a happy man. At, at the time, our facilities, training facilities were very poor and we used to train anywhere in the local parks. Yeah. So what we used to do, we used to get changed at the ground and we all drive to the local park. It used to be Gatley and they had a running track. So he used to put us on the running track just to warm up, just to jog around. And he used to come out with two plastic bags over his hands and he used to walk around and he used to pick the dog muck up <laughs> on the pitch all the dog muck, put them in a bag, put it in the bin, said, right lads, you can train now. He was so worried about one of us uh, getting a cut and sliding into dog muck that he used to clean the pitches. We used to call it Dog Shit Alley. <laughs> and that was the name of the, the training ground, Dog Shit Alley we used to call it, because he used to be there every day, two carrier bags, picking lumps of dog muck up, you know, because the dog walk had been on before we even trained. <laughs> and we, used to, and we used to think, God, oh, he must be mad here. We said, we're not bothered about a bit of shit, but Danny just said, it's got to be clean. We played in the FA Cup and we played Queen's Park Rangers. They were a premiership team and they had Les Ferdinand, Ray Wilkins, Peacock, and we played them. And uh, we had, we'd worked all week at practice. And, and on the Saturday, we turned up and one of the players hadn't turned up. And Danny was panicking. He, had, he was having an anxiety attack. He was panicking. He was going mad, shouting at the physio and everything. And he run up and down the corridor, speaking in Spanish. And we thought, oh God, there's trouble here. So we sat there and it was getting later and later. Anyway, we find out the lad's food poisoning. He'd had something to eat the night before from a takeaway. He got food poisoning, he was out of the game. So Danny come down, named the team, disappeared again. Then at 10 to three, he came in. And at our place, we, we didn't have a buzzer then from the referee. He used to blow a whistle in the, in the corridor, didn't he? Yeah. Get us out for, for the kickoff. So anyway, he blows a whistle and Danny comes running in and he throws his notebooks on, on the table and he shouts, listen to me, lads. Discipline begins with your food. On a Friday night, if you want to take away, don't have any of that foreign shit, have a kebab. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he were all laughing. Isn't the kebab foreign? And we were all laughing. And we're running out, and the BBC cameras were on us, and we're all running out the dugout. We're all laughing at what he just said. And that, was a, that was his team talk for the game. We won 2 1. It was one of, the best, one of our best victories. The team but, talk was all about kebabs, right? Yeah. <laughs> don't eat any of that foreign mess. Have a kebab. Well, everybody, everybody was burst out laughing. Eh? He'd be running out, and you could see it. I mean, wife said, why is everybody, it was on match of the day, why is everybody laughing when they're running out the dugout? I said, because Danny's team talk. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, doing a team talk with the thing on the board. Tactics board. And yeah. all like that. Moving players about and all like that. And then one of them falls off. So, so Gaffer, number four there is, fell off. <laughs> I said he was having a shit game, and oh. <laughs> <laughs> he was having a crap game. Yeah. <laughs> well, you number four. No, no, no training, training. Training. <laughs> We had a good team spirit, didn't we? He, he sort of built that, and the lads, the lads were good lads. Though. The lads he signed the, from, from, from a, however long he was there. Every yeah. time the camaraderie was on the field and off it, building all the time. And that, I mean, he was unique for doing that. Uh, other managers would try it, but it wouldn't happen. Danny, it just happened. He, he was part and parcel yeah. as well. So we we, we found the song because yeah. we, we used to get on the coach and if we'd won in London, we used to put it on. It was one Tanamera. 
<laughs> and we used to sing, one Danny Bigara, there's only one Danny Bigara, and everybody would be up clapping and dancing, and then he'd be at the front with the mic singing in Spanish. And, and I know it's a Cuban record, but he used to be singing the song, and we used to sing it all the way home. <laughs> it used to be brilliant on the coach coming back. <laughs> Do you remember when he changed, he changed the running out music? We didn't have, really have a, a song to run out to, and Danny, and it was around the World Cup, but was, was it 94? And it was to be number one. And Danny loved it, and he thought it really epitomised what we were about. So he got, it was a cassette, of course, in those days. So he gave a cassette to Kenny Boxall, Kenny's our announcer. Of course, Kenny hadn't checked that it had been rewound. So he puts it in. And this was obviously one of Danny's tapes. He's got a mix of music on it. He's put it in. Danny comes out waiting for to be number one. And it was this song that went, Maria, Maria. And Danny's going, no, no. <laughs> to Kenny. Kenny's there, oblivious, thinking it's the right song. So we had the football team running out to Maria, Maria. Still never found out who sang it. But we didn't run out to it again. Joy for Burley Football Club, joy for those tremendous Burley supporters behind that. Stockport County goal, I don't think the Stockport County players can quite believe it. Oh, it's absolutely tremendous just to see um, John Pender going up the steps there to receive the playoff trophy. You feel sorry for Stockport once again losing out. I think the first one hurt the most. Yeah. There was a goal, if it had been VAR, the goal would never have stood the winning goal against Peterborough. That was, yeah. that was the worst, the first one was the worst. I played in all four of me, and the Burnley one, we were so much on top and we were 1-0 up and, you know, and it, it, they, they were starting to get niggly Burnley and, and we lost our discipline and that, that, we just went down, but we still kept in there. We only lost 2-1, I mean, down to nine men at Wembley and it's a big pitch and it, it takes all the energy out of you. And we, we kept in there and we thought, we've got a chance here because Big Kev was all, he was running around like an idiot, Big Kev, two, two metres high, strong, muscular banging their defenders and we thought, we've got a chance, if we can just get the big Kev, he might do something, you know, but in the end we lost 2-1 and, and I think after that, it, it was so underwhelming, it like if it drained you of emotion and, and everything and when we came back the next season, we seemed to have lost something, you know, it just didn't seem to go as well as it had done the, like, the previous years. And the Peter one, the fans, I mean, there's a period yeah. of that game when I think it was when we were, were we 2-0 down Danny that game? Danny McGarrett's blue And we scored. The Danny Begara's Blue White Army, they sang it oh, and it dang. went on and on and it oh, no. built and it, the hairs on my neck are actually going yeah, up now so emotional, yeah. thinking about it. And the play and all, all the commentators said, this is unbelievable. Stockport County are losing here, but all you could hear was Danny Begara's Blue White Army. You couldn't hear the Peterborough fans. And that actually, we scored a goal. And it was the fans that day that almost yeah. pretty much scored the goal. It lifted us. And how we didn't get oh, well, something did, out of that game I is... I did something right then. You did something right. Because I was in the stands watching and shouting. And Maybe you've got it going, Jones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> cheerleader. I passed my sell by, sell by date then. <laughs> They still sing his name today and everybody joins in. And yeah. a lot of our younger fans feel like they've missed out because they weren't part of that journey. Mm. But everyone knows him because his mm. face is everywhere and uh, everyone tells the stories about him. And of course, the family uh, still visit us regularly. His son, Simon, still comes over to games. Uh, his wife, Jan, and the rest of the family. When the family come from Uruguay, they come. Uh, and we treat them as we should do, like royal family. Because you know, if there's royalty in football, Danny Begara was a Stockport County king. Mm. Uh, and You'll never ever get that again. It just came, he came at the right time to a club. He came to the right club because we were desperate for success and change. So we were welcoming mm. to change. There was no resistance to a foreign manager. We, we welcomed it. And in fact, as we said before, I think he paved the way. He was the pioneer, the trailblazer for yeah. a lot of the managers that followed and never probably got the credit he deserved for that. But he'll never be forgotten in this part of the world. And of course, as you'll know, there's a, now a, a road named after him right next to the stadium, uh, Bagara Close. Uh, the new housing estate there has got his name there, so he'll never be forgotten. As well as a stand, right? And I the stand, the Danny Bagara right. stand. It's funny, yeah. the other stands, people are very protective at the ground. Cheed Lens, always the Cheed Lens. So even when you get a sponsor, they never mention the sponsor. No. The railway ends the railway end, they don't yeah. mention it. Pop side. The pop side, the pop side. It, it has become the Vernon stand over the years. It's now the Together stand, but again, it takes time. Danny Bagara stand is the Danny Bagara stand, <laughs> because it's actually bigger than the old title of main stand. <laughs> Yeah, we, I mean, we have 
Uh, we have the, we've had the Uruguayan kit as a, a tribute to Danny. Mm. Uh, the Uruguayan flag flies every game behind the railway end, so it's visible to all the home fans. So it flies at the railway end every match. Uh, there are car flags, there are, there are basically the Uruguayan flag with Danny on it, with some of Danny's fantastic quotes on it. You know, he's, he's, in fact, one of his famous ones was, uh, we may not be a, a, a big club, but we've got a bloody big heart. And there's so many things that he said, and they're, they're all, the fans have taken those on and put them onto all sorts of different memorabilia. And we don't stop them. We don't try and say, you can't do that because it takes money away from the club because it's unique. And, and of course, the supporters uh, cooperative now are in the middle of raising money. And it, he will be the first person ever to have a statue uh, made for him uh, at Stockport County uh, by a very, very talented uh, sculptor. It's not cheap and they're, they're raising money now. It takes some time, but he'll be the first person ever and he deserves that. When you think, we've all talked about what he's done in the game, you think he was the first foreign manager, what he's done for Stockport, uh, bringing that Latin American flair to a little fourth division English team and taking us where he's taken us. Look at where we are today uh, in terms of the stadium and everything else. Uh, he deserves that. And once, when, when that gets unveiled, that will be a big ceremony and a big party. And uh, he'll never be forgotten. We got the pride. All right, we got a small house, a small house, but we got a big bloody heart, I tell you. And uh, while the lads keep doing that, what they've done today, we can only be proud. Mientras el Stockport County sigue luchando por recuperar su estatus en la Football League, ya que actualmente están en la quinta división y fuera del fútbol profesional, aquí en Edgley Park, cada fin de semana, sigue ondeando la bandera uruguaya en honor a su máxima leyenda, a Dani Vergara. Esperaremos a que le hagan la estatua aquí fuera. Y mientras, seguiremos recordándolo.